All right, well, shall we get started? Uh, thank you all for, for coming out this early in the morning. Uh, we are very excited to uh, welcome Kurt Squire to speak. Uh, Kurt is the Romnus Professor of Digital Media in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction and the co-director of the Games Learning and Society Center uh, at the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery. Um, he's the author or editor of three books and over 75 scholarly publications. Um, Ren, he's done a variety of work in games and learning, uh, games and virtual worlds. Uh, he's one of the founding members of the Terra Nova World of Warcraft <laughs> Guild, uh, which is where I first encountered him and his work uh, when I was a master's student. Uh, so I'm very excited to have him here. Um, and he's going to be talking about his work with the Games Learning uh, Society uh, group today. Sure. So that seems like a, yeah, a good perfect. place to start. And I will let Kurt take it from here. Thank you. That's great. All right, so uh, yeah, so I should acknowledge our funders and the kinds of people we work with. One thing that's weird about this slide, you see that we our, our center works with a variety of people, ranging from assessment companies to private philanthropy to Department of Education. Um, and really what we've been looking at are how are interactive technology shaping how we plan and learn. This is really what interests me. Uh, it goes back to, as a kid, uh, everything from, you know, of course, growing up with Atari, building games on Commodore, and, and so on, and just thinking about what is the impact of, of these kinds of t uh, playful technologies? And for my own particular research has been in what is their potential for education and learning, both inside and outside of schools. Um, and so that's kind of the very broad things. Um, this last kind of chapter of uh, at least my career and our center's career um, uh, is really involved uh, running a center called Games Learning Society, which is in the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery. Now what the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery is, is it's this kind of fancy building over here, which is, um, uh, I designed to be one of the preeminent uh, biotech research centers in uh, the Midwest. And uh, we are one of seven research groups that uh, our colleagues include like Bionates, Optimization, um, Regenerative Medicine, and we are the games people kind of thrown in the middle of that trying to understand what it is that the kinds of research they're doing and how can we translate that to the public through apps, games, other sorts of interactive media. Um, and so one thing that's been kind of fun for me, because I'm, I'm normally in a school of education, I know we worry a lot about using technologies in schools. For the past five years, we've been doing that, but also just looking at the broad population, right? How can we get this kind of stuff out there in the hands of users? Um, so our center has um, about 17 full-time game developers, depending on the day of the week, um, largely grant-funded, sometimes contract, um, about 25 doctoral students. Um, we do have a network of teachers and K-12 students. So part of my vision for how a center like this should run has been that uh, I really want to have people who are studying games, studying like what are kids doing with Minecraft, right? So people who study those kinds of questions together with developers who are developing games for schools and other out of, out of um, um, uh, school learning experiences, and then also together with people doing more, uh, maybe more recent developments like learning analytics and so on. But not having, you know, your developers over there and your, even within developers, you know, your, pro, your interface programmers over there and your 3D programmers over there and your artists over there and your grants, but having them in one place together so they can work collaboratively trying to design and then research the impact of these technologies. So these are just some of the people. Also to recognize that this is not just me, right? There's a whole bunch of people trying to do this work. But again, it ranges from graduate students who are just looking at what kids are doing with media all the way over to um, developers who are maybe working in a pretty specific kind of domain. And what we've been trying to do is get those people together in one culture, but then also working with research scientists and experts in different domains. Um, so just to give you a little sense of kind of how we are set up and how we operate, this is our, um, uh, some scenes from our opening cer uh, ceremonies. Um, we have undergraduates floating around who are doing undergraduate theses on this all the way over to developers. And we've tried to make it kind of like having a game design studio within this research lab um, with open doors again to undergraduates. Um, one of the things I'm most proud of, we built our own arcade cabinet for all of our games um, and also runs emulators. On. But um, we have this out for our conferences and things. So if you want to try any of our games, just throw in a token and you can actually play them. And, and then there's BMO, but that's just because BMO. Um, in terms of our staff, um, up until recently, it was read by, led by Brown Pelletier, who was a creative director. He worked at Raven Software, which is an Activision studio. Um, he had in his past done you know roughly 20 years worth of titles, things like Star Trek, and we brought him on to uh, really try to see what would happen if we ran again a game studio within this company. Um, and then uh, because of his connections, we could also then fan out and work like with the local mo motion capture studios and so on. So um, it really has enabled us to have this sort of full design shop. Um, 
one thing I'll say that really governs us, this is, is a sign that's been out my door for years. So one thing we really try to do is just do things and build things and then figure out how they work. Um, I actually saw um, Andre's uh, office this morning, kind of a design, synthesize, evaluate, and that's very much what we do. And one thing that I think has been fun about having our group in this research lab is that they're always shocked at how fast we go. So like, hey, let's you know build something, see if it works, create it, redesign it, and kind of go. Um, so, all right, so I want to talk a little bit about some of the challenges and some of the contemporary work we've been doing, and hopefully this will give you kind of a, both a high-level <coughs> view of the range of stuff, but then also we can drill it down on some specific points, and I'll have about 20 <coughs> minutes at the end if you want to um, really drill down on any particular kind of point. Um, so one of the big ones that we've been trying to do, and this is, I think, one thing I think we can say we can do now, is can we build games that are actually good, that are about good science, that are interesting and playable, and for those of you who have been maybe thinking about this for a while, this was not true, say, 10 years ago, right? 10 years ago, I don't think we had a lot of things we could point to and say, yeah, that's an interesting game, and that's embodying kind of interesting science or interesting content in a domain. So this first one is called Virulent. It was our first one, so the art looks uh, awfully crude, which you may notice. It was very shoestring budget. It was everyone's kind of first game in Unity on an iPad. But the idea was that you are playing inside the cell. So we were working with um, a virologist, John Yin, who um, saw a talk similar to this and said, hey, you know, I've studied uh, how viruses, um, uh, human immune systems, and, and other uh, antibodies interact, and there's really a game going on there, right? So the bo your human bodies are, are fighting these viruses, and they have these elaborate defense mechanisms, and it's totally a game, and we should make one. So we uh, put together kind of a loosely an RTS-style game where you are controlling the virions, trying to attack the body. And... Um, threw it up in the store and tried to see kind of what would happen. So um, we've, um, this is a game that's been out there for four or five years and really was proof of concept within this research lab that again, we could make reasonable good games that capture the science that people get excited about. One of the things that happened right away that was kind of cool was that as you started to build representations, um, I don't know if we have one here, but the slicer enzyme is an example where they said, well, we don't, there really aren't representations of it much in books, so we, you get to make whatever you want. So our artists are really excited. Like, we have one of the first, you know, broadly disseminated representations of that enzyme. Um, we also got good arguments between the virologists and the epidemiologists arguing about what actually would happen. And so we feel, in our work, we usually feel like we're winning in terms of accuracy when they can't agree. And we're like, great, so you guys sort that out and come back to us, and then we know that we're at least in the right level of accuracy. Um, so um, we've been doing some research with this. So we've, uh, again, put it up in the store. We've had somewhere around 20, 25,000 downloads. Um, we've been doing some controlled studies, looking at what happens when people learn this content through playing the game and reading a description versus looking at static text diagrams. And um, we've seen some positive gains here. So you can see, um, no, it's, not, it's relatively opaque, actually. Uh, oh, but the, look at the charts. Those are better. So you can see some um, the, the text and game condition outperforming the text diagram. One of the big things that we found, honestly, and this is something that will come up probably more in Constance's talk later, is that a lot of this was actually due to the fact that the kids just didn't care when they were doing the, reading the text and the diagram. Like, they would look at it, and it was largely engagement. They were like, okay, so I answer some questions. Um, the kids in the test condition, we saw two things. One, that they were much more engaged and they, they really cared. But then second, a lot of times they would actually think through this and say, well, when I was in the game, um, I remember being a virion, and this is how I attack the cell. And so being able to put people in that position uh, was a lot of where the kind of interesting cognition was happening. Uh, so a lot of what we took away from this was saying, this is a good pilot, and what we're interested in doing is, can we say, get a whole lot of users, and we know that they're getting some learning gains, uh, it should be gain and not gains, sorry about that, to create an even broader impact, right? So this is at least kind of a test case. Um, what could we do that would really uh, have a much more profound shift on public understanding in science? Um, so again, realizing that this is where we are and we have access to these scientists, we thought we, maybe we should do something that's a little more cool than that. So um, uh, my team, we got together and we thought zombies, and, and that, that's, that's gonna be our answer. So we looked at the other research groups and we found a group that was doing, um, it's one of the leading groups in the world on regenerative medicine and stem cell therapies. And we started kicking around ideas, and we thought, you know, it'd be interesting, you know, when would you need to use stem cells? And like, one, if there was a zombie outbreak, and you needed to grow new organs because they were constantly getting eaten or something. So uh, that's what we did. And we, uh, after some cajoling, we got them to sign off on this idea. At first, they were a little hesitant, and um, we said, the zombie outbreak can even start in your lab. And they're like, okay. So um, what we did is, um, and actually, the other lab is not far from here, you know, just south of here in the hollow. But the idea is that there's been a zombie outbreak and you and your staff of regenerative medicine people are going to cultivate stem cells and, and solve the zombie uh, invasion. So 
in the game design, there actually is a lot of room to have an excellent first-person, uh, you know, survival horror zombie game. But, but in addition, you're you're working in a lab cultivating stem cells. So this is uh, Dr. Jamie Thompson, who we worked with, and this is actually his lab developing the game with us and actually play testing it. Um, he's uh, again one of the more famous scientists, most famous scientists in this area. Um, one of the things that we got out of this playtest that really had me excited is that we, again, when we know we got it w right well enough, is a couple of the um, scientists actually said, can I take this home and show it to my spouse? Because this is this kind of captures what I do. And by that, what they meant was that I take these um, pluripotent cells, we, in we induce them towards differentiating different types of cells. So in this level, you can see you're forming a group of red mesoderm cells, which becomes um, skin. There's different types of cells, sorry, stem cells that differentiate into different cells. And you can see you kind of eventually grow tissue. Um, this is a very simplistic, um, um, simplified rendering, but it was accurate enough and it didn't violate any important principles to them. Uh, we add, did add in zombie, uh, we got to invent our own kind of zombie tissue that would theoretically exist. Again, for us, we got to the point where they signed off and then said, yeah, this isn't, you know, wrong enough that we would not, we would want people to play this game. They would learn more than not. Um, and so from that, we decided that we wanted to, again, release this in just the broadest way and see how many different plays we can get, and then understand what kinds of learning are occurring simply through gameplay. Now, in a lot of my work, we really do work with, and I'll show in a second, we work with teachers and we work to build resources around the game. But in this case, if we just release this thing, what might we learn about what people learn through gameplay? So we did a series of studies, and this is really one of Constance's student, Liz Owen, working uh, with our lab and Rich Halverson. Um, looked at um, what were the pre and post increases just in a really simple kind of way. So total gameplay, we found an 11% average increase in knowledge of stem cells, which is good. I mean, it's kind of a good thing. Um, but more interestingly, as we started digging in, we, um, and we're tracking all of the gameplay data that players do, right? So every click, uh, the entire click stream is logged and saved. And what we found were that something that we're calling um, this last, success, last cycle success ratio. And what this is, it's, it's really simple. It's basically on the last cycles of the game, right, so the final levels, are you doing better in terms of winning and failing than you did at the beginning? So in the beginning of the game, if you, say, did really well, you aced it and you weren't failing at all, and you did in the end of the game, you actually were less likely to have pre and post gains, in part because you already kind of knew the material. Similarly, if you were kind of sucking, to use a technical term, at the beginning, and still in the end, you probably were playing with something like trial and error and really weren't learning anything. But if you did, um, did not do well in the beginning, and in the later levels were actually playing well, that correlated well with how much you learned on pre post tests. And that to us was really exciting. So we're starting to see that some evidence that the gameplay actually does map to some form of um, scientific thinking that we are detecting through our measurements. And I think it starts to get at some of these questions we've had in the field about, well, are they really learning, or is it just trial and error? Um, and stuff like that. And so this to us is a, is a promising thing. And I should say we've seen this pattern, uh, we're, we think we're seeing this pattern play out in other games where it's this sort of learning through, um, if you can detect that people are actually playing purposively, learning from what they're doing, that tends to correlate well with, with learning games. Uh, as a part of this, we built something that we call Adage, which is an open source system for telemetry data. And this is kind of a fancy, confusing graphic, um, just boxes and arrows, but basically the idea is that you get different kinds of data coming in, so player action, what you're clicking and when. You get the virtual context, so what's going on in the game, you know, what's your health bar, um, what's, a temp what's the state of the user interface and so on, AI if the game has it, and then system events as they happen. As we take those data, a usually designer tags them in some way, we do some data filtering, um, relate it back to the basic game design, and then um, um, from that, start to develop metrics. And this is a more generalizable approach that we are using in a couple of our games. Um, mostly it's an open system architecture, and what part of what we're trying to do is figure out what parts of this process can generalize and what parts um, um, are really particular to, you know, to particular games. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Okay, so if we go from that stem cell game, which you know, we thought was you know, great at what it did, um, and, and it you know, taught some people about maybe stem cell science. Um, when we think about things like classrooms or even informal settings, part of what we want to do is go beyond just, say, conceptual knowledge, but really get people engaging in authentic practices of science, right? So as a science educator, um, I know I can say, well, conceptual understanding is important, but what we want people to do is to start doing science, to affiliate with science, 
to um, start using the language of science. And that really comes down to something we call authentic participation. So in this work, I want to talk about a game that we've built called Citizen Science. And in it, what you're doing is really this core game cycle. So you start by kind of talking to people. Um, you collect evidence, and then you complete arguments. And this game is really centered around a lake in Madison, Wisconsin. I know at least a few of you have been there, Lake Mendota. It's um, the, really the centerpiece of the city, or a centerpiece of the city. It's in a precarious situation because it's becoming eutrophic, meaning that it's becoming um, uh, generally less cl more cloudy and filled with algae and less good for the ways that we as humans use them. That'd be a good way to put it. So what you do in this game is you're a kid, and you start by talking to people like the scientists, like boaters, like fishing uh, people who fish in the lake. You then collect evidence about what's going on in the lake, and then you make arguments. The game's story is based around the idea that you um, you actually show up in the lake one day, your dad is taking your dog <coughs> fishing, and, uh, I'm sorry, swimming, not fishing. Your, your dad's taking your dog swimming, and the dog jumps in the lake, and it's a high blue-green algae day, which means that it could be fatal for the dog, and your dog could die. So you need to stop, stop that from happening, talk to your dad, you collect some evidence, you complete an argument. This first thing takes place in about a minute, and you convince your dad, you know, don't let the dog go you know, swimming, he could die. But then from that, that becomes increasingly complex so that by the end, you're doing arguments with local farmers, uh, people within the watershed, and within the ecosystem, trying to convince them to do things like plant buffer strips for agricultural runoff and so on. So it's just this increasingly complex game cycle. Um, so you see there, you're kind of running around the lake taking readings. I should say this game is five or six years old, so um, it's in Flash. It was built by a company called Filmic Games that spun out of our lab. So it looks a little, um, a little different. But in it, you can see, here's your, so it's a, for those of you who know games, it's a very um, classic kind of adventure, a slightly RPG format. You have an inventory. In your inventory, though, instead of, you know, I don't know ropes and weapons, you have things like um, readings and uh, tools for doing, for collecting data. Uh, now, within it, I should say, one of the things that bothered me kind of right away was that we were building a game around a system that could be simulated and we have a very adventure game mechanic, which seems like kind of a classic bad thing to do from an educational standpoint. Um, now, on the one hand, we wanted them to experience the world as this kid and really use science to do something. But on the other hand, we wanted to give them a sense of kind of simulation and being able to run experiments. So within the game, we embedded a functioning small model of the lake ecosystem. So in the game, you actually run around and run experiments. People tell you to try to do different experiments. So let's change the regulation around fish stocking, and then see what happens to pollution levels. So if some, someone says, I think it's really because the DNR doesn't let us fish so much, and the fish would eat the algae, and great, so run some experiments and see what happens. So that's just kind of a fully embedded model that teachers can access, kids can access. You can just use this you know, at your, at your um, uh, whim. So as a part of our research on this, and this was one of my students, um, uh, Matthew Gatos, did a dissertation on this, we started by running just some real classic pre and post kinds of studies to see, is there evidence that people are getting anything out of this game whatsoever? So take a pretest, play citizen science, do a post-test. Um, the way we did the study was actually slightly more subtle. Um, this is building on Dan Schwartz's work on preparation for future learning, where we have the experimental group, so both groups take a pretest. One group reads a packet, the other plays the game. Both take a mid-test, then we flip it, right? So one reads first, then plays the game. The other one plays the game first, then reads. And we do a, a series of tests. And what we found is um, somewhat like might be predicted from situated learning theory, the theory that you um, uh, learning, uh, say, reading and other um, learning practices are tied to first-person experiential action, is that those who played the game first, um, had first they had a jump in the beginning, um, simply from the gameplay versus the reading, which I would also attribute, again, to interest, because these kids just really didn't care. Why am I reading? What's this lake? It doesn't matter to me. Um, but then second, they also saw a similar bump, because in part they were interested, and they had this experiential base that as they read, their scores continued to go up, uh, which for us was a really exciting first case that, look, this basic paradigm seems to be working, and this is perhaps a thing worth pursuing further. From there, we started building out a curriculum where they do the same kind of activity. So first they play citizen science, then they go and read outside of school. So great, you played the game in class, you kind of understand what you're doing, now go home and read some stuff. Um, then you, um, on the second phase, we have them go and explore other kinds of representations of these systems. So um, this game is one way to look at it. It's an example of one lake. We want people to look at other ones, have other kinds of experiences. Um, what we did with this class, and this was a class in a local school district, is go um, outside and play one of our games that are played on handheld devices. This is called Saving Lake Wingra. So it's a game where you go outside to the lake, 
um, you're, it's playable on um, like a pocket PC or a uh, like what it was originally. Now it's an iPhone. Um, where they, you know, so go, they look at the in the in the water and they say, oh, this is from carp. You know, this is there's carp that would grow here, or maybe there's a um, an experiment being done in the lake by some of the scientists, so they can go up and kind of see what's going on using their device. So these are games again that are played in the real world. This is the first lake they studied up here, and, and this is Lake Mendota in the first game. This is Lake Wingra down here. They're actually very different lakes. If you want to nerd out on lake science, um, this is very much. Um, full by a much larger watershed that includes agricultural runoff. Uh, Lake Wingra is partially spring-fed, partially very urban. So it's entirely urban watershed, so they deal a lot with saltwater runoff and so on. It's a much smaller lake by volume, much, much smaller lake by volume. Um, so this is a, kind of a map of the game. So what they're doing is, again, going outside, looking, really looking at, you know, looking at the ground, saying that's agriculture or that's runoff, that's stormwater runoff. This is um, how the lake is used. Um, again, this is uh, built using this era system. We do just kind of brief sidebar. So some of the work we've also been doing over the years is building games or game creation systems for things like iPhones so that not only can we build this game saving Lake Wingera that our lab built, but someone who lives there can make one. You can make one about your area. Um, there have been of varying qualities. There have been about 6,000 games produced for this system. Um, many of them are just tech demos, but there are some that have done pretty well. So there was a game called Jewish Time Jump that won some awards. It, uh, at various conferences lately that was built on the system. Um, so the, this is starting to be used mostly by educators, but it, it's a relatively robust platform. Um, this is an example of the editor, so it's relatively easy to just tag stuff and it shows up in game. Okay, so that's kind of the second phase is that you explore. So again, play a game about one game, um, one ecosystem, raise interest, give people situated understandings, let kids get excited about this. Two, go study another phenomenon to understand that not every lake is like Lake Mendota, so kind of expand their understanding. Um, go outside, which I think is a good idea if you're studying lakes, go see a lake. You know. um, that let them look at different maps and compare things. Um, the next thing that this class did was they designed a local study. So they have a lake in their backyard. So hey, you know, we found about these issues with lakes. What's going on in our lake? Um, so the kids designed one around their um, local, it's really a, a water retention pond, so it's maybe slightly less exciting. <laughs> but one of the things that happened that was really cool in this case is that they had a muskrat move in, and this was kind of the fun thing you can't mess up. There actually is a muskrat in the citizen science game, and the muskrat's trying to get you to let the lake become eutrophic because for a variety of reasons that might be better for muskrats. Um, they actually had that in their environment, so they were very excited. They did a study of it, and they measured the changes in water clarity due to the muskrat. Um, there actually was a, a town meeting about what to do about the water clarity, and the kids presented their findings at the town meeting about, you know, we've been doing a study on this. So in this case, they were actually doing some forms of authentic science. Um, the last thing they did, which we thought was pretty cool, is the kids started building different representations. They built models in Scratch. They built, you know, ordinary posters, but things to represent the things that they were finding about their environment. Now, for me, when I think about what does a game-based pedagogy look like, it should be something like this, which isn't to say we can't have, you know, hey, play a game like the zombie stem cell game and learn something about it. But when I think about trying to create robust learning systems, it really has all of these things. So you're using a game to introduce concept and uh, develop interest, but you are going as far as to have people make stuff and build representations, uh, oftentimes involving programming or other more sophisticated kinds of things. Um, so um, based on this, one of the other things that we got really interested in is that this is still very classroom, although again, they went to their town council, which is great, but could we create games that leverage kind of the virtual nature or um, of games to get people interacting across different ages and um, uh, careers and life and so on. So this is a game, um, we have two versions, one's called Trails Forward, a colleague, Ben Shapiro, who's now at Colorado, is working with this. Um, so it's an online game, it's a, uh, somewhere between a uh, large and massively multiplayer game. Um, but people are playing as roughly three roles, as loggers, conservationists, and developers. And what you're doing is you're playing on a, on a realistic map, or a real map, actually. This is a map of Vilas County in Wisconsin. Um, it is, um, they are um, engaging in logging or whatever their career is in a relatively realistic way. So uh, like other games where you have skills and classes, this is a game where you level up your tools and you're, you become a more advanced logger, say. Um, the game system itself has uh, currently seven or eight different types of variables we're tracking. So it's, you know, every type of tile is a land. We have the tree density and species. One thing that's kind of cool is the, um, I guess we don't have property value on there, but we actually have property value that we gathered from local tax records. We went on some tax databases, 
online, found what the value was, and then built some models where we can predict um, the value of different lands. And then we can also predict what happens if you say log an area versus don't log it. What does that do to the land value? So that ends up being what the people do in the gameplay, right? So if you go and you chop down that piece of land, what happens to the different species around there? What happens to the um, uh, land value? And then these different roles interact with each other. We did a pilot with that game in some local classrooms. And something that was really cool is the moment you're going on a real map, you have people were just jumping immediately to look at other maps, getting out resources. So kids you know, found a state map and were going, oh, what's, what's really right here? And where would be the best place to log and so on? Um, so this project, which Ben has taken over and is running with, um, the most recent thing, by the way, is they're looking at algorithms to find kind of ideal decision matrices. So what are the ideal um, decisions that might maximize return on all of these dimensions for all the people? Um, this project, while it was pretty cool, um, Constance used to like to poke fun at me. At some point, as you go down this rabbit hole of like what type of logging machine, <laughs> you're like going really far down the rabbit hole. So in order to have something that could be a predictive model where you could get some uh, ability to predict, say, oh, that's really what's going to happen to that land value. And you, you have to go into things like, well, it depends on how you log it. Are you clear cutting? Are you, which type of harvester are you using? What time of year? And for this purposes on this project, we went there. But then as we went into schools, the teacher said, you know, that's fascinating, but not all of our classes want to go down. You know, we don't want to spend all of our time on that. So we created um, a really simplified, or a much more simplified model called Econauts, and this is designed for the iPad. It's cross-platform, <coughs> other things. And, we're, and it's uh, meant to be also more gamey, so immediately you look at it, oh, that's a game. And in this game, again, you have the same types of roles. You're either harvesting, mining, or um, developing. Um, but we've added a lot of gamey stuff in. So we have achievements, and we have um, different roles and scenarios. and. Um, um, and then um, from it, what we've also tried to do is make this, this is data gathered from the game. So as you're playing the game, and you'll notice a theme, same watershed, so that's Lake Wingra, that's Lake Mendota. Um, you can actually track different pollutants uh, and from data generated from the game. So we are still able to do that. It still functions as a relatively simple, simple um, idea simulation. But you can see if you, you know, say we're to farm um, here in this one, the phosphates are being produced here. And as more farms go in, you see it move and spread throughout the watershed with the idea that kids could actually relatively simple, simply relatively quickly go back and forth and see what's happening in their games versus not. Um, as we've used it in classrooms, and we're just starting to pilot now, what we see happen, which is actually kind of cool, is that they will play, this starts happening, and then they immediately think it was somebody's fault. Like, oh, who dumped that? Or who caused that to happen? They have to go back and look and see, well, it's really an interaction among a couple of things. It's farming, which has farm runoff, and then the fact that you... Um, logged and this one here um if you cut down these trees that's a marsh if you cut down those trees that's really bad because the the um uh, phosphorus will run throughout and go throughout the whole thing so they actually get to look and say oh it's a combination of several factors and then ad hoc they start to develop policies like let's leave those there we all vote we will leave those trees there which means oh you just kind of invented buffer strips as, as a concept which we think is pretty cool um, we're working on cleaning up some of those interfaces creating new forms of data for teachers and parents, students to look at um, in our next round, what we want to do with this is really take this model, but then give people the tools to do that design work. So when I mentioned like those kids who played a game about their watershed and studied one and built something, we want someone to say, play this watershed, learn about it, and then build their own authoring tool, like water shortage scenarios in the West is something I'm personally very interested in, probably more so you people than me. But I think you should have a chance to say, oh, I'm going to build this, a scenario around that and show what happens and we can play it around. Maybe divert water and try to, you know, you can actually be, as a player versus player game, it could be very exciting, actually. Um, but what's also neat is that you could have those same DNR people and real people, you know, scientists studying each other's playing, having a conversation, to really kind of I, I would like to do is reinvigorate what we think about the um, public sphere and how you have discussions about this with, with using new media. So this is our kind of current work we're trying to do. Um, we th this game engine and platform I should say has been used for some crowdsourcing. So this was a paper presented at. Um, an um, ecology um, conference where someone used our model, see, someone, Stephen Plunkett, used this model to look at the American martin, which is an endangered species, and looking at how different um, approaches to land uh, management affected its um, spread of this species. So, Okay, so one of the last couple things I want to talk about, then we can take it over, is that behind this, I've developed more of an interest in analytics and, and data science. Now, this is not something that I kind of come out naturally. Um, and all, everyone in our lab is working on this. So this is something where um, uh, Matthew Berland is the PI. I'm co-PI, but PI on some of this work. Constance is doing a lot of this work as well. Um, so 
I've kind of come around to this, but we're, something we're trying to look at is what can you know from player data generated in game? What can't you know? Um, what, um, what are the ways that we should be using this kind of data well? And what are some of the maybe more dangerous sides using it well? Um, as a part of this, we've developed something called the Play Data Consortium. So this is a consortium of, oh, right now there are 20 or 25 different groups that are um, looking at these questions. We have the, our open source API I mentioned called Adage that many of these people are using, but not everyone. And looking at building kind of general, more generalizable tools. So one of my students, Dennis Paez Ramirez, has um, a heat mapping tool that he's developed that can go across three or four different games. So if you want to say, look at where players are clicking, and try to develop patterns from that and implement that in your game, um, his, he has a set of tools and APIs that will do that on top of this logging system. Um, again, it's open source. Um, I, what I think will probably happen is that you will see uh, groups that are um, <coughs> working in the more commercial sector have um, systems like this that have make a lot of claims and will claim to know a lot about what kids know and don't know, be very proprietary, probably very hard to get hold of, we want to have an open source alternative that will have very responsible policies about data management and ownership and try to uh, at least give people a legitimate alternative. But I, I'm, I am somewhat concerned that, that we're going to see a widespread of games for learning that may not be good games, that may not make responsible assessments, that will be very profitable for some people. And this is kind of one of the things we're doing trying to take that on. Um, maybe one last example, and this is a little bit old now, um, and this is, came out of our lab though, is looking at some of the um, ways that we want to try to under use things like analytics to understand design. So this was something um, um, some team members of ours, um, Gabriela Anton was one of them, Matthew Berlin worked on it, um, some others. But looking at using the, the Kodu platform, some of you might know Microsoft Kodu, it's a game development <coughs> platform. Uh, we developed a curriculum around it where you are, um, so kind of getting the, the Kodu 101, learn to use the game. Then we have series of levels that are, so if there's a game scholar in here, you might yeah, I see a smile. Yeah, so MDA, Mechanics, Dynamics, and Aesthetics. It's one framework. It's a great framework for understanding games. So we have a, a series of game levels that teach you about game mechanics, some about game dynamics, some about aesthetics, um, and then boss fights that kind of try to see if you've learned some of those things. So this is an online curriculum we call Studio K. And we've been look, building Studio, uh, sorry, Kodu Clubs, trying to understand um, what's happening. Some of the things that we saw in a very qualitative way are confidence and expertise and mentorship and creativity. Um, we also came up with three kinds of types. And this is uh, things we've seen in other kinds of uh, maker space type communities. So there are some who are very much like to play games, and they're your expert player, and they will play everyone's games and critique them. Some that really like to fix, and then others who create. So we found, and this was largely looking at log files. We could tell there are people who are spending most of their time doing any one of these activities. And so what we tried to do is then figure out how can we find people, label them, let the system reinforce that, uh, build achievements around that, and then achievements that encourage people to do the other one that they might not want to do as much. Um, so you kind of see some different versions of them. And then um, trying to then look, go back and look at see where are there patterns of data that say predict these different kinds of things. So in this case with Kodu, the land, this means someone's creating, so they're largely making land stuff. They're interacting with settings, a little, very little time programming, way little time playing, um, sometimes in menus and so on. Um, and then we look at where the cycles happen, and so where people are playing, programming, and designing. So you get a sense of the kind of broad analytics. This is some of our very exploratory work to see what kinds of things are worth looking at. So here again, here's a, a player type. So you can see how they're mostly playing, a little bit of programming, back to playing. This is a very different type. This is a very designery kind of person who's now flipping back and forth between program and design. Something that's interesting is that you know we talk a lot um, about iterative design, where oh you're going to play design, program, and here you can see evidence of where people are doing which and how. Um, again, this is very descriptive. Um, we're not making claims of which one is the best or what you want to see. Just trying to understand what can you, what can you know and what can you sort of not know from such systems. Um, this is kind of going to more level of detail of where we get that kind of data. Um, again, this is um, all using that adage system. And um, for me, I mean, I think the things that I'm most interested in, and this is, um, sorry about the acronym ARVILS, this is from a previous talk, but how can we think about, as we develop these kinds of products for research, how can we think about engaging the marketplace in different ways so that we can actually have these things scalable and get out there and be played and really be of high quality and, um, and out there beyond just the research lab? Um, something I'm deeply interested in is engaging the public in debates about issues around um, things like sustainability, around um, key areas in science like stem cell and regenerative medicine that could 
have dramatic impact on our lives and trying to see can we use this medium as a way to get those conversations happening in ways that we are not currently. Um, things like learning analytics, um, ultimately trying to find ways to on-ramp in the same way that something like say The Sims gets you playing a game, building stuff, and then engaging in actual buying and selling of stuff. Can we get people, say, playing games, making levels, and then actually doing forms of science in different ways? Um, that means integrating curricular models, getting multiple generations playing together, um, and you can kind of go on down the line. But this is kind of the work that our center has been invested and interested in doing. Um, I think my feeling is that we are edging up to getting some of the, I don't know, maybe killer app-ish stuff, but we're not there. But I think that we can hopefully in the next couple of years get some things we can point to and say this is really transformative work that is going to have a, a broad impact, which is kind of what we're trying to do. So, um, yeah, uh, uh, since for fun, so some of the things I think we as communities need to do is continuously try to be more open, because I think there are people who are going to have very closed systems coming up, and I think we need to deal with them. Um, sharing and aggregating and analyzing data. You know, for years we've been saying, oh, you, know, you build a game that's similar to mine, and can we share them with things like added your other systems. It doesn't have to be ours, but we could be sharing data. Um, um, ways that the games community and CS community, we can talk about that differently. Um, and these are some of the things that we kind of, we're trying to challenge our group to think about um, so we can act more broadly. So um, I do feel like we are at, at a cusp of some changes as, as education systems do things like adopt tools like iPads um, or whatever, Chromebooks, whatever it is they use. Um, it's important to me that we do some of these things so that the education community uh, or research community or games community isn't ghettoized and really can help inform how practice actually happens. Because I think we are at a sensitive inflection point where if we do some good work, we could actually shape how millions of people um, interact and learn. And if not, we can, um, something I want to say maybe not have happen is the idea that you have you know, people on the sidelines saying, oh, here's you know, what we think should happen, but then the mainstream system dominated perhaps by text textbook publishers and others create systems that are um, less desirable, I would say. So, that's it. This is an old slide, but we, um, I usually like to end on our conference that we have every year. <laughs> Crystal, you were probably leading that year, weren't you? Right. Yeah, she was the conference yes. organizer here. She's here now, so she's now yours. But, uh, yeah, anyway, I couldn't find an updated one. So thank you. We have time for some questions. Yes, yeah, so we work with, um, oh, I have that slide. Um, yeah, so we on, we, we have uh, 25 schools that we are working with in an after school setting pretty intensely where they run a 10 week curriculum. Um, now we did not get IRB permissions for that because that takes about two years, unfortunately. So, um, and interestingly, all of those districts said that we really wanna do this, just you can't research it, and so, yeah, um, there's a lot of local politics around that in Wisconsin. I'm happy to talk with you more about it on a different day. Um, but we are doing that work using them. Um, let me see if I have the other slide about the num um, some of the people we're working with. Yeah, but if you go back up, um, I want to say, um, I should take a picture of the map of the schools we work with. In the Madison area, we work with, um, yeah, in the Madison area, we work with, probably eight districts where we have gone out and run one or two, one or two day workshops and they build curriculum where they work with our stuff every year. It's getting to the point where when kids and classes will come back and they play the games in our lab, like, oh, I'm playing this in school. So there are people doing that. Um, and I know that like the citizen, uh, citizen science game has been published on Brain Pop, and when it goes down, I'll get teachers uh, like emails from someone like in Memphis saying, I'm using this game in my class tomorrow. You know, get it back online, go, okay. <laughs> So, um, um, so I know they are out there and getting used. Um, one of the questions is really around research and what type of research you want to do, and you know, um, and so on. We've, um, I don't know, Constance, we have know any more of the updated stuff around that. So, yeah, so the answer is yes. Um, in Madison, though, I should say one of the trickier things is that, in general, the, the approach is that the district decides what curriculum is used. Teachers aren't supposed to decide that. And if you want to get something new in, in theory, especially those school board and whatever, and that, that is a long and lengthy process. There are 
on a grassroots level, teachers who bring our stuff in um, and use them, but it is, it's much more on the one-to-one. -one. Um, we have largely stayed out of the getting formally adopted by large numbers of, of districts because, from my experience, the more you go down that road, particularly if you get permission at the district level, you end up having to strip out everything that's interesting about the stuff to begin with. Um, and so we've decided to not put our energy in that thing. Having said that, we are in talks with one state about developing a game-based curriculum where we might make some of those compromises just to see can we get stuff rolled out at that level and I take a shower afterwards and say, oh, that was bad <laughs> education. But hopefully it won't be too bad. But we're, we're, we're starting to explore that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for the talk. Um, I, I was wondering if, uh, have any of your games um, started to take advantage of like the... Uh, the whole like the the social and the sharing uh, kind of atmosphere that's that's really grown from things like YouTube and Twitter, where you have um, kind of like this meta game uh, that encourages kids to you know like share this information and oh well I can really do this or have you tried this and you know like mm -hmm. message boards and things like that uh, and I was wondering if any of your games have like started to investigate that or look into that yeah. Yeah, I mean, to me, that, that is in part, uh, it's always a game design challenge I put forth for our designers. Like, make something that is enough of a game that someone could have a creative solution. We're like, that was awesome. I need to share that. Educational games typically don't do that, right? There's like, oh, there's one simplistic understanding. And so we've been working trying to come up with that. Um, I, my read is that the best way to get there is really um, that sort of eco, uh, this model, Econauts model, um, where it's competitive and it's multiplayer. And there are solutions that are better than others, and the fact that you can make scenarios. So I think that's the way to do it. Now I should say, because every step of the way, I would say, I think now we've got a game that does that, right? So the virulent game was relatively complex. Some levels are really hard to beat. I mean, we intentionally made, which also, by the way, is problems in school. So we made some where it takes 10 to 20 tries, and then that is another kind of thing that's hard to have in schools. Um, but we've really found a lot of reticence to doing that. When we design our curricular models, um, we, along with Constance, we uh, ran in uh, a summer, or sorry, a spring break program where we did a lot of that intentionally, and we had achievements for going on to message boards and describing games, and we had um, all of the games were enveloped around an encompassing curriculum. So in the case of the virus game, uh, we had a curriculum where you were trying to understand a, a, a fictional virus that was spreading throughout. You get a call from the CDC and they say, here's a game that's a little model that you can use. And so we built a lot of metagame around that. That worked pretty well. Um, my feeling though is that in general, we have not got that kind of, I'd, I'd like to see that spontaneousness of like, yeah, this was great, I'm gonna upload it. And my feeling is that this one isn't, I mean, it's not quite there, but with balancing this sort of genre and type of game, it could get there. So, so it's, I'll say it's a goal, it's a, a set of design goals and I think it's, um, um, where we need to go in games, yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry I was late, so you might have already okay. covered this, but uh, building on this, I'm sort of curious because you have a long history of working with party scale commercial games mm -hmm. for you know, mining the ed stuff, and then you're also doing all this work creating your own games that have an explicit educational moniker. Like, and especially in relation to this question about the meta game and the social and blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. I mean, what are the relative benefits of those <coughs> strategies, right? Because they're different kind of scaling and yeah. outreach strategies. And I'm curious what you think, having been in both, or sure. still being in both worlds. Yeah, I, I think, when, so I did a lot of work, uh, Mimi knows, maybe, not, maybe not everyone knows, I did a lot of work for years with the Civilization series, having kids um, play, well, I made mods, and then having them build mods for each other and play mods, and um, which was great in many ways. Um, one of the tricks of that though is that the idea of even just getting like civilization, this was Civ 3 at the time, but getting civilization to run in something like a school or an after school lab is so difficult. That was kind of one sort of barrier. Um, uh, there are a couple of barriers of that sort. Um, the other thing is that you, you're, you are always inheriting a bunch of design decisions. So if it's a historical game, there's gonna be a certain whitewashing of history that's going to be in there probably for market reasons or whatever. Um, and, uh, and then also just not having them necessarily built around topics that we might think are particularly provocative. Um, those are kind of some of the cons. On the pro side, I mean, it's simply getting a well-designed, balanced game is non-trivial. Um, with the Civ series, uh, we definitely saw 
I think there were way more opportunities to have that kind of relatively spontaneous organic sharing um, for a, a bunch of reasons, um, including like the game has robust mod tools in it already, um, just the way the game is designed. Um, so I mean, I think, I think one of the, when I think in general, though, it's a setback, I think in general the pros of kind of rolling your own are that you have the capacity to get your own data. So it's really hard to get from the game, you know, what kinds of data, what kids are doing and not doing. Um, getting a relatively simplified uh, learning or user curve so that someone walks in, doesn't know what's going on, they're doing something within the realm of academically meaningful within five or ten minutes is oftentimes hard in, in a more commercial game. Um, yeah, and, said, and then just the logistics of it. Um, the, there are a bunch of other downsides, though, um, where um, um, I think right now what's interesting is I think if you look at just games like uh, Plague, Inc., which is a great, interesting um, epidemiology game, um, there are uh, many games coming out of what might be called the indie scene or whatever that are really interesting that I think are going to be far more interesting than what we do. So something I should say I mentioned moving forward is can you have a game like this and two people actually just left our lab to try to make a version of this strictly commercial to say they were going to license the technology, but now they're not. Like, I'll just build it strict ground up. But I think, you know, maybe they can be inspired by some of these and make something working solely within, like, the ecology of indie games or commercial games that are designed to kind of live and work in that ecology. And that, to me, would be interesting, particularly if institutions like ours could have Students who maybe see, my, my dream is maybe a, a student comes in, like, that's a really great idea, but it's totally wrong. I'm going to go and make a better one, launch a company, and then you have good relationships so we can still do research after they graduate or something. That's, that's I think, where some of the change will come. Because I think the developers who are coming through who are age 18 to 26, to me, are the most exciting, have way better ideas than I do, are going to have a way better long-term influence. So, so maybe that's a, a positive look, that I think that's, that's where, to me, some excitement is. Um, I will say, as a part of that, w the moment you're working in like grants and you've got this large artifice, I do oftentimes feel like, like um, you get you can easily get bogged down by a lot of stuff that helps make all of these, whether they be funders or project criteria, work. That I oftentimes kind of I don't know. You, you look at those other spaces and think maybe that's going to do better innovation. But, yeah. Uh, so a minute ago you were speaking to kind of the challenge with adopting like classrooms and, and the sociality of. You know, taking these games like, oh, like that moment. Mm -hmm. You said, you spoke specifically to the example in the virus game, like, oh, it maybe takes 10, 20 tries to defeat it, and that's a challenge to adoption. Yeah. But have you considered, like, that implies then that the educational goal is linked to a win condition? Have you considered in any of your games, games that you haven't mentioned, like an educational goal that is actually not linked to a win condition, but perhaps to a loss condition? So, like, after two to three tries, you know, they go, oh, well, actually, this loss condition is what leads to. The educational goal. I mean, like, sim I, I think in like similar terms to like RPGs, where you try that like boss fight, you know, two, three times, where you're like, oh, I'm supposed to lose. Oh, you gotcha. The story in, a, in, a, in an actual way. I mean, I, in the virus. It's a great idea. No, we haven't, not that I can think of, have we done something like that? There are potentials in this one, I know, because we really, we do want people to try to do some really bad things and then, but, but, um, <laughs> But yeah, no, that's, I know what you're saying, because I play a lot of RPGs, and I, right, I think that's a really... Try to, yeah. Rather than be locked into that, like, 10 to 20 try thing, just go straight for the failure. I think it's a great idea. <laughs> go do it. Build it. That's a great... See, there's a case in point on how old you are. That's a case in point. It's a great idea. That should be done. Yeah. I'm curious whether you have to contend with even intellectual objections to the work. One of the things you said was that you wanted to make some form policy, and obviously the case that you shared with us about Yeah, we've, we've been actively looking for those more. So we've been more <laughs> trying to find things that are going to be more contentious. Um, yeah. Maybe we should talk a little bit about like, the new partnership only and how maybe in the reverse it's that a lot of people working in that domain see digital media as a way to engage the public. And Do you want to say? No. <laughs> uh, well, that that is that, yeah. So we we have we have um, we had one of our kind of first partners who does work around in agriculture and trying to inform the public about sustainable agriculture come to us about building a game that could be similar to this, 
um, maybe a hybrid between this and the more predictive model, but trying to come to us so that people play it to our, you know, who might have a real balanced opinion about it, to try to understand very deliberately what the trade-offs are. And so, um, yeah, I mean, we, we chose, I, I should say in a way, maybe we're surprised we haven't gotten more. I mean, the moment, like when they opened the building, there were people picketing because of stem cells. And we thought, well, God, now we got stem cells and zombies. Surely we're going to tick them off now. Right? That's our goal, you know. Um, and we really didn't. Um, we, yeah, we really, we really haven't seen as much as that as I would have thought. Yeah. I, I was going to share something with you and the school and the students here. There's an opportunity that I just found out about. The X Prize Foundation mm -hmm. is sponsoring a $7 million uh, challenge to uh, develop a mobile app, which is probably a game, to help with adult literacy. Mm -hmm. So um, the application is due in December. I can give you the card so if you want to follow up with the guy, see if you want to do <laughs> your school. But we're trying to see if we can get a team here at UCI. Fantastic. So maybe the students here has interesting games that compete on that. Yeah. You'll have a partner with education. Awesome. People of those sort of so, But that's sort of how, you, how they're trying to see the market with um, mm -hmm. new initiatives. Yeah. The short answer to the question, it's something we think about a lot, and I thought we would see more of that. Um, you know, I have slides in this deck that talk about anti-intellectualism and games as a way to do it. And I, I think so far we've just been surprised that at least the people that we intersect with um, don't push back on that. I think it's fair to say. I wish they would. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it, the question in the similar vein, have you thought about it? But given how design is so important to so much of what you do, have you, have you ever thought about creating a game that helps teach design? Yes. Um, yeah, um, well, I mean, we worked some, what's that? Kodu. Yeah, Kodu does that to some extent, and we worked some, uh, Constance and I both worked some on GameStar Mechanic back when that was on its early iterations, um, and um, we, we've been thinking about it also that in a way, we're pro in a way, if we do our job right, we might get, we might get some of that coming out of this format, so if we get a, a robust design community. They're designing scenarios around global futures. Maybe we'll get some, but it's a different, you know, right? It's a different type of design. The one way I have thought about it is that if you could get a design community going around this, who then find themselves in need of a vocabulary, maybe you could insert a series of design tools that would help them. So I love when you can get a group that's designing and needing something like, oh, I wish I had a name for that. Like, Aha, here you go. So maybe that's kind of how we've thought about it in the past. Close? Close? I mean, I guess if there's no more questions, we should thank Kurt and thank you. Yeah. Uh,